Okay, we're back. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone that participated earlier today. I think we did a great job of setting the table for this panel discussion, getting some perspectives of expertise around the world, talking about some case studies. And I'm really looking forward to this panel discussion. And, and in my opinion, this is sort of the meat and potatoes. Like we've been talking about this standard, it's being rolled out you know, all over the world from, from our perspective, at least we hear about it. And I really wanna have the perspective of the industry here looking at this and thinking about it objectively, is this something that we want to push into our market? It is, is it something that the industry wants the, the, our, our, our public uh, projects to implement? Is this going to bring a lot of value uh, to our industry? Um, is this the right tool set? And you know, if it is, what needs to change for our, our industry in particular? And one area that I really want to focus on, if we can, with the panel, not to steer or cry too much, who's going to moderate, but uh, I, I want to not forget about the small to medium sized enterprises. Uh, I mean, that makes up the bulk of our industry by far. And, you know, asking small companies to pay $750 for a document and go through this learning curve and, and uh, participate in this framework just to be able to participate in these projects in itself is another hurdle. So we need to consider that as we go forward as an industry. So really looking forward to this panel. I'm going to let Cry do the introductions uh, to the group. Um, but Cry is uh, he's a leader, the digital innovation innovation leader at uh, Dialog, which is one of Canada's uh, largest and most sophisticated uh, or multidiscipline, I believe, uh, firms across Canada. Cry, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Tom, and um, appreciate the introduction. Um, as we said, uh, welcome to the uh, panel section of the uh, of the event. Um, I'm Cry Bachman. I work for Dialog, but I'm also one of the um, organizers of the event. Um, I was working with uh, Tom and Jerry in the background, um, and we wanted to set this event with an opportunity to give you an introduction to the ISO standard. Um, we wanted to let you hear from industry experts across, um, you know, that are actually applying this. But as with anything new, um, the question arises, what does this mean for us? Um, what does it mean for, you know, you on your projects? So we wanted to round things off with a panel discussion of what is the relevance of the ISO 19650 standard um, in the Canadian market. And so with that, we've gathered experts from both Canada and internationally um, to discuss this. Um, and with that, we're going to do some quick introductions. I am going to introduce myself quickly um, first. Um, like I said, uh, Tom said, I work for Dialogue. We're a multidisciplinary practice um, in Canada. Um, and though I will be moderating the panel, um, leaving most of the conversation to my um, fellow industry experts here, um, I do have industry experience with the ISO standard, uh, working with its predecessor in the UK, um, helping clients implement BIM level two. And I sat on the BIM for local governments task group there. But more recently, I've been working with clients here in Canada um, that have been looking to implement the standard on their projects. Um, so. I'm now going to introduce the panel. Um, we're going to uh, do this. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves um, because they usually will do it better than I can. Um, I'm going to start off uh, with Paul Shilcock. Paul, you want to give us a quick introduction? Yeah, thanks, Cry. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Shilcock. Um, I'm, I run a small management consultancy called Opram here in the UK. Uh, there's two sides of the business. Uh, on the one side, we provide strategic advisory services to governments, organizations. Uh, major projects around the world to help them to align their business processes uh, to the latest industry standards and best practice. Uh, on the other side, uh, that's where Opera Academy comes in. Uh, we provide uh, innovative uh, learning resources to help organizations and teams to build the capability and capacity that they need to manage information effectively. Um, as a hobby, I, I develop some standards. So I'm uh, the author of ISO 19650 Part 2 and the UK National Annex. I was co-author of PAS 1192 Part 2, which is the framework document for BIM Level 2 here in the UK, uh, and also PD 19650, which is a transition guidance from 1192 to 19650, uh, plus being involved in the development of a whole raft of other sort of standards. But that's me. Awesome. Great to have you uh, on the panel. Um, next, we'll do David Watson. David. Hi, I'm uh, David Watson. I'm with NBS, and our field of expertise typically is in the specifications field. Uh, NBS is actually a much bigger company, uh, both in scope and size. Um, it used to be uh, based in UK, actually still is, um, but it operates globally now. Um, it came into Canada when it acquired my company as a Digicon Information. Um, 
Uh, Tom mentioned uh, small and medium enterprise businesses. Uh, I counted my old company as one of those. And um, my interest in modeling came when I wanted to integrate specifications with building models. And so I started to do that by uh, attending um, ISO meetings at, uh, as a representative of the Standard Council of Canada. Uh, and I continue to do that. Um, I started that actually since 2000, so over 20 years. I also attended uh, technical summits for uh, Building Smart International, uh, where a lot of the same people were, were going and meeting and uh, allowed me more networking uh, opportunities to find out how this technology worked. And, uh, and that kind of led to me becoming a director with Building Smart Canada. Um, so I, I have been following along with the 19650 uh, all along, even since, um, um, the, the 1192 series in the UK where uh, most of that work started. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to call on Amr Saad to introduce himself. Hey, thanks, Barry. This is uh, Amr Saad. Uh, I'm a Camden, Camden member and I'm a charter the manager from the RICS and also an Autodesk expert early. Uh, I work here in the Middle East where uh, most of uh, the clients from government and private sectors are mandating uh, ISO 19650 and before that, that's 1192. Uh, I implemented the information management uh, practices in mega projects here in the Middle East, including uh, FIFA stadiums, uh, very large shopping malls and educational facilities, and some heavy civil structure. I'm happy to share uh, this experience with the panel here and the audience, of course. Okay. Thank you, Emmer. And last to round out the panel, uh, we've got Raul. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Craig, for having me. Uh, my name is Raul Shah. I'm a sector development director for British Standards Institution. Um, I support the AMIA team uh, with respect to built environment. Um, prior to joining BSI, I worked in the industry, and since 2006, actually, you know, I've been sort of supporting uh, design consultants, mainly architectural practices, main contractor and asset owner developers in terms of implementing 3D sort of CAD-based workflow from 3D CAD to BIM and, you know, the standards-led approach and so forth. So a pretty hands-on uh, experience from, uh, uh, you know, driving Revit, you know, Revit plugin, shop.net codings, blogging on Revit and BIM and all the way through to implementing standard-based approaches as well. So really delighted to be part of this conversation today. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So now that we've met our panel, let's dive into some of these, uh, into the conversation. And starting with, of course, the question, standards, um, you know, we love them, we hate them. When it comes to the standards, um, you know, is this, do you love it? Do you hate it? Why, why is this such a big deal? Um, you know, is it a, a blessing in disguise as a dry read? I might sort of start out the conversation there. Um, I'm going to call on uh, on David to kind of kick it off and give your thoughts on this. You know, what's your what's your take on the on this ISO standard? Um, well, I want my comments to kind of address standards generally, and then ISO a little more specifically. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, common fact that comes out in, in surveys, both in Canada and globally, that um, the, the root cause of problems on projects tends to be due to lack of communication and lack of uh, quality documents. And, and um, another um, uh, root push that's kind of moving things along is um, uh, the, the sense that um, agencies are starting to require digital um, documentation. Uh, it's being pushed, of course, by, primarily by government, but um, I think smarter uh, private sector companies are, are asking for it. And in order to create a digital delivery, um, the best way to do that is to create and, and manage uh, digital data. And the unique thing about our uh, construction industry is that unlike aerospace, where there's maybe two or three prime owners and, and a very small collection of vendors that work for them uh, in the construction industry, um, it's, it's wide open. We've got um, probably hundreds of different uh, disciplines and uh, any, any potential building owner is, is, is a potentially an owner. And how do we get all these people and all of the various uh, applications that they use um, to, to collaborate, to work together? Um, and, and, this, and that tries to resolve this lack of communication. Well, in my mind, the only way to do that is to adopt a standard. And really, even at a small level, 
you almost have to adopt a standard within a, a two man company to make sure that the two people um, can access what they need. And if you multiply that need or desire into a much bigger uh, team, like we're talking about in construction, um, you have to standardize on some level. So if that's the case, why wouldn't we try to um, draw upon the expertise of the 80 countries that work together on that on the ISO 9650 standard and um, and put their collective thoughts and agreement on uh, how is the best way to operate at a, at a at a high level? Why wouldn't we take some of those principles and and make them part of our our local um, ethos? And so. Um, I can I don't see why uh, uh, anyone, even a large or organization, who may need to deal with other large companies or uh, global companies who who may do work here, or if they do work outside the country, um, are certainly motivated. And certainly, the scale of savings uh, by standardizing on things uh, is, is, I think, obvious. It's brought it was brought up uh, before, but from a small, medium uh, enterprise viewpoint. Um, you, you rarely have the power to dictate what how a project should go. And so if you uh, adopt a standard internally, you may get a client come in and say, hey, do you know this 650? And if you do, you're, you're welcome to that team. Um, so there's uh, all uh, lots of advantages and, and very few disadvantages. I might also ask, it, Raul, what's your, what's your take on it? Um. <clears throat> Thanks, Craig. I think I think David summarized it pretty well, but I'd like to add a couple of things. And people might think that I'm biased because I work for BSI. True, I no. work for BSI. <laughs> right? But trust me, this is my unbiased view. I think what standards allows us to do is three things, in my personal opinion, uh, which are really really key ingredients for any successful change management or project management. Uh, or, or BIM implementation in this case. Three things, and I think David already touched upon uh, a couple of them. Uh, communication, number one, collaboration, and consistency. David, you touched upon the, you know, the quality, quality of data. And I think many of our, uh, you know, speakers today also, you know, um, touched upon, uh, you know, having that quality data because the whole uh, point of having this overall information management framework uh, rather than I would say, you know, standard, but, you know, a framework. It's about improving collaboration, communication, and consistency in our industry. And if we look outside just the BIM and digital conversation and we look at safety, for instance, or, or quality management systems in businesses, whether it's small, medium, large enterprises, and you look at ISO 9001, 14001, 45001, right? They are all management system sort of frameworks. You know, I like to use word frameworks. And, and the way they allowed the whole overall industry, for example, in terms of safety, we made great strides in improving safety on sites. And many of our, you know, the GCs and construction colleagues could, could, could uh, you know, validate that, that too over the years, right? And... And this common language, common framework has played a huge role. You know, ISO 45001, for instance. Uh, you know, um, you look at, um, you know, 9001 as a simple sort of, you know, management standard, management framework. I think having some sort of common language, common framework allows not only asset owners to measure performance against various teams, various projects against where, you know, and, and various assets, but also it allows asset owners, clients to foster that collaborative uh, approach, foster innovations. I think in my mind, again, trust me, this is unbiased, you know, somebody who practiced and implemented, you know, standards approach. I think it's very, very important to have a, a common language, common framework, standards, call it ISO 1960 or not, but having, uh, as, as they say, you know, having some sort of method in madness is always important yeah we we heard we heard from others earlier on about kind of a, a common language a framework That's it. um it's, it's a bit more open we've heard structured data talked about you know here and there um you know it, it, and even uh, tom kind of poking the bear there and sort of saying you know early on is this something that's sort of accelerating our technology use or is it something that holds back innovation because standards get in the way kind of thing you know paul as, as somebody that's you know 
worked with different organizations internationally, um, you know, looking at implementing uh, this and other standards. Um, you know, what, what's what's different about this ISO standard? Um, you know, why? You know, you you were one of the authors of it. Um, how do you, how do you see it making you know its impact on our industry? You know, whether that be Canada adopting it or any any industry out there that's looking at this right now. Um, yeah, like you say, I mean, I've I guess I'm, I'm slightly biased because I've spent the uh, best part of ten years uh, developing the things, and along that way, there's been times when yeah, I've certainly hated the things. Uh, but yeah, generally that, that that drive has come from this desire that you know there's got to be a better way. You know, in terms of, of, of what we do as an industry. Um, and whilst 19650 might not be perfect, you know, I do genuinely believe it is a better way. You know, and it's not just me saying that. As uh, David said, there was a huge collective, international working group collective who, who input their knowledge and experience into this. Um, and so, yeah, so for me, that's, you know, that's the um, why I think, you know, standards really play a huge role, really, in trying to underpin and letting that foundation on all of these things that we want and strive for in terms of BIM and, you know, things that we've looked at today in terms of the digital twins and the technology and trust structured data and all those sort of shiny things, you know, information management is the bedrock of that. I would go as far to say is that you're not going to achieve any of those unless you get your own house in order. But in terms of how that relates or translates uh, internationally, you know, I think every country and you know, Canada included, I face the same challenges when it comes to the construction industry as a whole in terms of the way in which we deliver and we operate uh, the built environment. Uh, and I think what 19650 does as a process, that's ultimately what it is, is it's the information management process. It provides that unified approach. Uh, it's a unified approach that su suppliers and the supply chain can apply, you know, regardless of which owner that they're working for. It's a unified approach that uh, owners can apply to all of their assets, you know, new and old. Um, and when we start getting into sort of the national digital twin era, it's a unified approach that governments can use, you know, for their national infrastructure. Okay, so it's it's multi-tiered in terms of the the benefits and, and its application. Um, but you know, the information management is a team sport ultimately. You know, so it's not something that you as an individual, as a team or an organization can do it on your own. Okay, so it needs to have that so co cohesive uh, effort behind it, you know, in terms of everyone uh, working to that unified approach. You know, there's no more um, room for this is how I do it type sort of approach when we're trying to work collaboratively. Yeah, and speaking of the um, uh, un unified approach, um, I'm just double checking if we've got Amr still on the line here because he was. I had, I had chatted Craig. with him about. Oh, Craig. He says he's in the. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Okay, we still got you. Yeah. Um, and Amr, uh, we we had had little side conversations before. Um, you had seen this as a, you you had the opinion of kind of a lot more need with for structured data. How do you see the standard? You know, in helping on the projects that you've worked on on that side of things. Like when you look on, in our region, we have a unique uh, situation where we have uh, multiple consultants working from coming from different uh, countries, and the uh, data is coming together in one place. So the importance of having an agreed uh, language and agreed structure uh, when we exchange the information it plays an, a very important role uh, in the project success. Uh, like I would, sh I would like to share an experience uh, coming from Stadium, like where we have an Italian company uh, and uh, multiple offices coming from Germany, UK, and the US. And you can imagine the different cultures working on the same project. Having a structured approach uh, and agreed approach to work uh, on this project is very important. And this is where uh, it's not only about the language, it's also about the data structure within the information that we are exchanging, the language, uh, the contractual agreements as well is, is a very important point. To, like I know that we will talk about it later, but having it in the early phases plays a very important role in the project success. 
Yeah, and I think we we heard about that. It was it was interesting, kind of hearing uh, Mike in the last presentation uh, talking about how you know this this potential stand you know this standard fits right in. Everyone kind of gets easily caught in new buzzwords about digital twins and stuff, but it does sort of kind of fit into it. Now, you know, with you know the North American market, in my experience, you know, um, we've got it. You know, a few of you are coming in here uh, internationally. I worked in the UK, and coming into the North American market, it I did find when I transitioned in, um, you know, in times, uh, you know, in Canada, whether you're going from province to province, city to city, people sort of have that statement of, you know, well, this isn't how we do things here, or, you know, uh, I, I like that standard, but, you know, um, maybe we can make our own version of it or adopt, you know, change it slightly for us. How, if this is truly an international standard, then how do, how do you know, different um, groups, you know, across Canada and everything embrace it. And how do we, you know, look to adopt that? And I might, um, uh, look to kind of address that, um, over to, uh, uh, David, maybe what you want to give your thoughts on this? Sure. Um, glad you mentioned that. Um, one of the roles of, um, building smart Canada is to help take these ISO standards and, and also standards that building smart create and adapt them for the Canadian marketplace. That's one of the main reasons why the chapter exists. And um, a few things that have been um, happening even most recently is that uh, we took the 19650-2 um, standard and um, which um, would uh, had a, um, a UK annex on it a national annex, which uh, gave some more national context to the standard um, if, for things like uh, which classifications are recommended and, and uh, created a, a matrix of coding uh, that was going to be used within the UK as a way of kind of standardizing at the national level, but uh, still complying with the international standard. And so Building Smart Canada is doing that. We've actually created this annex. And uh, if any of the viewers want to go to the Building Smart Canada website, there's a place where you can download the uh, proposed annex and, and provide your feedback. Um, Building Smart Canada also um, had created under the, the previous name uh, IBC a contract appendix for um, trying to smooth over uh, some of the roadblocks that were holding people back from uh, working more collaboratively. And um, that contract appendix is actually, it's still um, available, but it's being uh, currently looked at and updated from the viewpoint of the 19650. So, uh, so we make sure it fits within that uh, environment. Uh, we're also doing things like um, uh, working on a, a level of uh, information standard uh, that's that we uh, like and would recommend in Canada. And so um, all of these tools are Canadian relevant tools that help take a lot of that uh, high level stuff that you see in the ISO standard and apply it to a mar much more local level. Paul, when, when the when the when you were working with the other authors on the ISO standard, was that kind of the the intention with the standard is that you would kind of create you know, as much as you could a framework for adoption, but then, you know, if there is local variation, that that's where it would be adopted. How, how was it seen kind of? Yeah, um, to be honest, not not initially, no. Um, and, to, you know, the, the intention wasn't to have these, these sort of regional variations, if I'm being honest. Um, and to a certain degree, it's a, it's a bit of a shame that we have found ourselves in this situation. Um, well, just to give you a bit of context to it, um, as has been mentioned on a couple of the presentations already, um, the, when you develop an international standard, you have to use something that is deemed rightly or wrongly to be best practice already existing within the industry. Um, and that happened to be the 1192 series. Um, so in terms of the first step is to elevate that. And as soon as we sort of got the working group together um, and we started to go through and, and to sort of deconstruct uh, the 1192 series, it sort of became pretty clear early on that there was, you know, whilst the vast majority of the, the concepts and principles um, everyone was in agreement with, there were certain elements that, you know, just never in a million years were we, were we going to get a consensus on at a national level. So um, the we got to a point where we felt there was this need to have this, the, to bring in the, the option of a national annex. Um, so if you think of an 80-20 rule, 80% uh, of, of what you need is in the ISO, and that's common across all the countries that adopt it. Um, and then the other 20% is uh, the national annex and national forward, which uh, enables you to um, add clarif regional clarifications. So it doesn't add any additional requirements. It just enables you to add clarifications. Um, so I'll give you an example. So one of my other 
hats that I wear is for Centre for Digital Built Britain uh, over here in the UK, and I work on the international team. Um, and for the past 18 months or so, we've been sort of supporting uh, the, the US in terms of looking at their adoption. Um, some of you may have seen recently that the, the US has, has done a memorandum of understanding with the UK. Um, so I sit as part of on, on that team. Um, but early on in those conversations, there was that, you know, well, you know, we don't necessarily, we don't do it that way over here. Um, and, you know, even if, you know, ideally there would be one way of doing it, but, you know, each state or each province, um, you know, does things slightly different. Can I, can um, I but, ask you, do you think, do you think it's the right approach or do you, is, is part of it that you really wish we, that it, it had been embraced as a whole? Personally, I'd like to see it embraced as a whole. Okay, so as I may have said, you know, one of the key drivers for that international standard uh, was for to enable multinational organisations to be able to work across projects uh, across countries. You know, without having to tailor their own thing. I mean, you just you just got to scale it up. You know, as a supplier, you got you work you work to different standards for each client. Uh, that's a pain in the backside. You know, you multiply that internationally. You've got read, you know international ways of working. We've we've had WSP and Taylor Townsend on this on the, the the conference already. You know multinational organisations they're currently having to have completely different ways of working on each country. You know so that for me was one of the big drivers for the international standard to try and get a unified approach internationally. Um, if I, yeah, if, for, if uh, I can I'll finish off on that. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but in my personal view, I would have liked to have one standard if, if i can add uh, to this as well uh, again i will just pick the last sentence if we have uh, different supply chains or different consultants working uh, across different countries imagine uh, they are doing uh, way uh, extra effort to develop tailored standards to meet uh, tailored client requirements which is introducing uh, a massive waste in the design process, in the construction process itself, and uh, it, it ends up uh, with uh, poor uh, quality products, with lots of abortive work, and uh, let's say poorly maintained assets. So when you look at the, at the beginning, everyone is uh, looking for uh, at the briefing, as let's say at the project brief, the client is expecting everything to be perfect. But because there is no standard way of communication, there is no contractual agreements, there is no uh, common language, so he ends uh, ends up with a miscoordinated project. Project is not meeting his uh, business goals, and he is uh, it's not sustainable. So when you look at it from uh, a wider uh, view, adopting the standards will reduce the waste during the design phase and during construction and of course during the operation and it will reduce the let's say the claims within the project it will in, uh, reduce the ambiguity within the projects so which will lead again if we adopt it uh, consistently which will it will transform the construction industry and Raul on your side of things from a standards organization background or being involved in one, what what's your take on the whole taking it as is local adoption? Um, I think uh, <clears throat> Paul already, uh, I think, articulated most of the points that ISO 9080 framework is structured in a way that you can take it and apply it, um, you know, to to the context that you want to apply to and. If you remember Ben's, um, you know, presentation today uh, from Acon, um, you know, he mentioned one of the one of the things that he experienced uh, when he worked at Scanska and you know, going through the BSI BIM Kite Mark certifications, you know, and it was more about the application, the implementation of standard, and and this is what I love about that, you know, the whole conversation. I hate it when people just simply take. ISO standard, any standard, whether it's 19650 or, or, or other, and simply copy paste and try to implement without contextualizing it. But, mm. but you know, when you take the standard like ISO 19650, which, you know, as policy 80%, in my opinion, I think it's 
more than you know around 90 to 95 percent is there you know like the core core of it what we are talking about you know as clive showed in his initial keynote presentation you know the eight stages of right from the assessment all the way through to you know the the, the tendering information assessment of supply chain and you know mobilization plan and so forth right so those are the eight core steps of ISO 9030 part two, if we just talk about part two. Yes, we have national variants in terms of how we classify documents or name documents, for example, right? Status coding and revision coding and numbering system. But I guess as we move towards, you know, more data-driven economy and digital twins and, and what Mike actually articulated in his presentation too is about, I think slowly, slowly industry, industry I think we are moving from digital documents to I think true data driven industry. And once we are in that space, and as, as Amor, you know, uh, 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 Amor Saad you know, mentioned, it's more about the quality of data, no longer about conversation on the naming convention of documents, so to speak, or information container maybe, you know, in future, future I'm talking about. So I think ISO 19650 and in my role, <clears throat> I work across, you know, many countries in, in, in Europe, in Middle East, in India, you know, Africa. And I can see that, you know, many clients across, you know, those, those, those countries, you know, are taking pure ISO 9650 uh, sort of framework and applying, contextualizing within their own region businesses. So going back to your original question, uh, right, you know, can ISO 9650 be um, applicable to Canada, Canadian industry, different provinces, you know, different regions. My short answer would be absolutely yes, because you know, it's as I said at the beginning, it's a it's an information management framework. It's a management sort of process and standard, and and you've got to standardize uh, your information management processes in order to, you know, gain all the benefits that you know many of us talked about during the day today, right? Improving productivity efficiencies, you know, the cost and and time improvements and so many things. And ultimately, actually, um, um, you know, improving safety and sustainability in our industry, which I think is 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 is, is at the core of this ISO 9650 framework, overall framework is about, uh, you know, uh, having that positive impact. And I, you know, I was so pleased to see uh, Ben, you know, focusing heavily on uh, you know, safety and BIM, and and so was Mike as well in his presentation. I think it's a very, very important point. And I think this whole ISO 9050 framework, uh, having, you know, a structured approach to managing information, digitizing information, actually paves the way for improving safety even further and sustainability in our industry, in my opinion. No, I appreciate the comments. I mean, that was one of those things that I think when BIM Level 2 was coming out, a lot of people kind of looked at it and said, you know, okay, I want a BIM level two job. And it's, you know, they just wanted something that they could just copy and paste. And I think ISO, with this ISO standard, it's gonna be a lot of the same as people initially get into it. But I think one of the things it does do is initially set out to sort of say, um, you know, like one of the first things we said it, you know, whenever they said, oh, it's a BIM level two or it's an ISO 19650 job is, okay, where's your EIR? Where's your, your data requirements? it's actually prompting clients to start to really engage in the process. Um, and, and thinking about this, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of banter today about, well, you know, and it especially came up in the question period. This is a, a, a big undertaking for somebody to take it on in some ways, but it also kind of sets out the steps, you know, in the framework for somebody to adopt. What does this mean? You know, the questions come up again and again, small, medium companies, how do you, how do we see this, um, you know, uh, being adopted at that level. Um, you know, uh, Raul, I know you, you you kind of mentioned it briefly. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's a very, very good point. Um, and and um, in my personal opinion, I think SMEs are the ones in our construction industry. And I'm going to actually flip the question on its head now here. And, you know, the, the SMEs on the call actually, you know, think about ISO 9650 as a tool to actually mitigate your own business risk. Now, if you take that lens and angle, if you think about the projects that you work on and the amount of challenges you have, um, you know, on collaborations, the communications and the consistency, and therefore your payment from your clients, 
right? Uh, agreeing the exact scope of your services, for example, as an SME, right? Um, so all those challenges that, and I've been, I've been with SMEs, I worked for small architectural practices. Um, uh, I also worked for small manufacturers in my early career, having come from the mechanical engineering background. And, and I know how challenging that is because when you work with the large clients, you know, and they keep everything open-ended, right? In the scopes, and there are lots of gaps in scopes and so forth. Now, if you actually enable your business yourself with ISO 9650 framework, you can use as a tool to actually manage upward, you know, the chain upward and your client and say, well, actually, according to ISO 9650, you ought to be giving me um, clear information requirements, for example, right? You, you, you should yes. be telling me that when I need to submit, you know, which part of the information and most importantly, what would be the acceptance criteria? That's something, you know, most of the time you would see EIRs, you would see BAPs, you would see MIDPs and MPDDs. And, you know, sometimes client would have really great vision, big, uh, you know, comprehensive requirements, but, but, but there may not be, um, you know, clearly articulated acceptance criteria. So if I was an SME, I would be asking that first of all, say according to ISO 9060 framework, could you please tell us you know, how my information would be validated and verified by yourself when I submit it into published mode you know, for approval? Because that then you know, gives me clarity in terms of my payments, my invoicing schedule, and you know, the, the, the durations and so forth. So I think as an SME, I know it might, same and I know Clive, Clive showed you know like a pile of documents. Trust me, it's not that big. Of course, if you combine all the guidance and everything, you know, then you have thousand page worth of you know like a Bible or something. But you know, ISO 9050 Part One start with that only forty page document concepts and principles. Get it right, right? Then move on to Part Two, which is another forty six page document. Simple. Keep it simple. Again, if you go into ISO framework is such a great document that it articulates actually and you know you go into the appendix actually of the document part two and in the table it articulates clearly you know there's some some obligations for the appointing party or asset owners say for example or lead appointed party say architect for example or appointing party so anybody else on the project whether you are SME or structural engineer or ME so so I think I think it's it's, it's such a great uh, framework document. The SMEs, please, you know, my one recommendation to you would be uh, use it as a tool to protect your business, to improve your bottom line, and actually to manage your own clients and tier ones. Yeah, if I can continue on this as well. Yeah, go like, ahead. Uh, when you have small and medium companies dealing with multiple clients it's in their favor to have consistent internal processes. So they can manage the change internally and they can also manage up as Rahul mentioned. So it, uh, having a standard approach, and here we are not talking about models and drawings. We're not talking about engineering information only. We're talking about all the information related to the business, like having uh, contracts, uh, like I would, I would say having some sort of smart contracts rather than traditional contracts, adopting structured uh, information approval systems, uh, adopting uh, data-driven validation, uh, chain, uh, automatic change tracking and uh, verification. All these uh, processes will benefit small to medium uh, practices. And of course, it will, it will bring more value to the, their small practices and definitely will give them a better a competitive advantage uh, in front of the client and in front of uh, other competitors as well. Absolutely. I think I can summarize that really well, actually, being a, a small enterprise guy myself for 20 years. Um, 
typically we're talking like a, a two to five person company. And if you're working on one or two projects, you can come up with your own internal strategy and management of your own information. And you're dealing with very limited number of clients. Um, as soon as you start to scale up, whether you start to grow in size uh, within your organization or um, what's more, more like is this two person company will start to collect um, 10 projects instead of the one or two that they used to work on. Um, if you had an established management strategy to keep track of where your status of all these 10 projects are, um, you can, sure, you can do it internally, but why wouldn't you embrace all of the knowledge that was captured in the ISO standard and contributed by enterprises that are much, much bigger than they are? Adopt the same ones and you'll see the rewards when you go, when you do uh, scale up and you start to take on more staff and more clients uh, and you'll be able to scale up without having to make any more changes. And of course, the other uh, benefit, of course, as a small guy, you're trying to uh, attract businesses uh, yourself. And if a company, a larger company, a client uh, comes to you and say, uh, we want to use 19650, boom, you're already there. Nobody's ever going to come to you and say, we want to use your internal purposes. I shouldn't say nobody. It might, it might happen, but I, I would hope not. So that would be the, the argument for that uh, small, uh, small business, I think, is um, potentially benefit almost as much as a big one, just in a different way. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And just, just wanted, wanted to add one thing, Craig, you know, before we move on. You know, I think for SMEs, you know, the key message here is, you know, is, I think you have this great opportunity, especially in North America, to be a disruptor rather than being disrupted by, you know, the, the, the large companies, you know, you can be a lot more agile in terms of, you know, adopting these new ways of working, right? And protecting your business business bottom line. So I think, yeah, you know, ISO 9060 framework is a, is a great way, way, way to achieve that. Just uh, quickly, Kai, sorry. So just to put it into perspective, not in terms of the benefits, um, and, and ISO 19650 part two, which looks at the delivery phase, um, there are 40 activities within the process. Uh, as an SME, and I'm, I'm, I'm caveating it, if you work as part of a larger delivery team, uh, which typically you will be, you know, you're only actually involved at a quarter of those activities, and you're only directly responsible for half of those. You know, so don't be thinking that I've now got to do all of this thing. You know, and as Raul said, you know, a lot of the upstream activities should be done for you. You know, and if they are, and if they're done properly then that will make your life a lot easier in terms of you understanding what it is you need to do. Uh, the, the problem I see is that when the client doesn't do or the owner doesn't do what they should be doing, then the, the lead contractor consultant doesn't do what they should be doing and they just pass it all the way down and they leave it to the SME and say, right, there you go. You sort out this whole BIM thing for us. All right, that's when the problem starts, but that's not how it's intended to be within the standard. Correct. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, speaking of the client side of things, um, I, you know, I was in the UK when BIM level two was mandated at sort of a, you know, national procurement projects. Um, and then, you know, but we quickly saw an evolution where it seemed like the private sector suddenly went, wait, hold on. What's this thing that's being mandated by the central government? What, you know, in, when you think about private sector versus public sector, do you think that this is something that should be uh, that or will that will be adopted as it rolls out more within the private sector, or do you think it should be something that actually needs a bit of a push? As you know, if if, if the public side of things mandates it on their projects, um, do you think that you know that's the needed push to get it actually recognized and out there within you know a market such as Canada? And I might sort of uh, we'll put this one over to maybe Amr. Do you want to sort of take this one on? Yeah, I just, uh, again, the key here is the level of information need. Uh, so when when you're talking about private sector, they have uh, a specific information requirement to manage their own portfolios. And uh, having this clarity will bring value to their portfolio. But from a government, a go government perspective, they have multiple private sectors operating within the same country. So they need to receive consistent information and they, they are expecting a level of compliance and level of integration between different types of asset. Uh, imagine a new development, uh, you have an infrastructure uh, project and have housing project uh, on top of it. So you need to have integrated data. As a, as a government, you need to dictate your requirement and you need to uh, 
mandate uh, certain, uh, let's say, uh, information requirements, certain uh, approval criteria. So uh, private sectors can develop their own uh, information within their own uh, portfolios in line with the government uh, guideline. And also there is uh, another uh, point here, which is the legal aspect of it. So the government uh, should facilitate a legal framework that enables proper information exchange between the government and the private sector and within the private sector itself. So, uh, and in the region here, we have lots of semi-government uh, uh, owners. So they, uh, they have their own portfolios, they want to, they have their own EIRs and they want to uh, drive their project in a certain way. But there is always a bottleneck when we interact with authorities because authorities have different requirements uh, coming from different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, municipalities. And it is more challenging when you have external consultants who, who are not aware about the local requirements. So uh, getting uh, documented standards and documented information requirement at, from the private sector owners and from the government will, uh, I would say, will make our life easy. This is the most thing that, like, this is the most simple word that I can say, because at the moment it is, uh, it is difficult to manage. And I believe it's introducing waste again and inefficiencies. And clients are striving for efficiency and uh, better, post, uh, better cost performance. Is there anyone else that wanted to chime in on the private versus public side of things? Yeah, Raul. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, you see, um, if I look at if I look back in time and look at the UK experience with the whole thing, I think we had. We had, uh, you know, a real great balance between push-pull, you know, push from the government, but pull from the industry. And I think that, 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 that pull from the industry, if I look back in 2011, when the government mandated, you know, as part of the strategy, you know, or introduced BIM level two sort of concept and announced, you know, five years period by 2016, you know, BIM level two. Uh, before 2011, you know, there were private sector clients, projects, who had already embarked on that journey. And I think Skanska was one of them at the time, um, you know, who had pioneered the BIM-based approach. Uh, and, and, um, and, 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 and those early adopters, uh, you know, and the clients, uh, private sector, tier ones, and, and, and design consultants actually contributed towards this whole thinking in the UK that, you know, actually this whole BIM, BIM way of working level two BIM and all those concepts could actually benefit the UK government as a client to achieve those, you know, benefits, you know, the savings and the time and the safety and sustainability and so forth, right? And then government sort of mandated and sort of, uh, enabled the UK industry to, to, you know, to make it mainstream, right? So I think you need, you need both. You need those, uh, Innovators, I would call them, or early adopters or disruptors, let's say, you know, that, that creates the right level of pool and demonstrate to the government and authorities that, look, there are values to be, to be you know, have, you know, by implementing this way of working. And then the government's role is to actually sort of make it mainstream, right, and support SMEs, support the wider industry through a lot of education programs. You look at UK BIM Task Group, UK BIM Framework now. CDBB, so government invested over the years, uh, you know, a lot of resources in terms of, you know, uh, bringing the whole industry up, you know, and on the journey. But you need private sector, you know, sort of pull and the government push as well, in my personal opinion. I look at it a little yeah. more simply that um, the motivation for private sector to adopt it is that they see value and efficiency or quality of the work that they're doing, which is all uh, perfectly valid. Um, but when a government uh, or a public sector mandates it, it's almost like if you want to do that work, you have to comply. And so uh, for that reason only, I, I'm thinking that um, the public mandate are probably going to drive the rest of the industry uh, as opposed to the other way around. Although both, both viewpoints are valid. Paul, you, you had something? 
Um, yeah, I'd probably tend to disagree slightly in terms of this whole mandate uh, discussion. So I think, you know, uh, I, I think the, any government, not just the UK, uh, generally governments tend to be the largest clients in terms of construction spend. Um, and, you know, but basically they're not very good at it, okay? And the money that they waste is pretty obscene. And it's obscene because it's basically our taxpayers' money, okay? Um, and when we look back at the uh, in the UK in terms of the, the BIM level two, that was actually a requirement on the clients. So it wasn't a requirement on the supply chain, okay? So this mandate, if that's the word that we're going to use, uh, comes from the client then um, requiring that um, supply chain to manage and produce information in accordance with a particular process, okay? So it wasn't like a the government's, I know they said for more projects, but that was a requirement on the government client departments, not on the supply chain. And the way, obviously, there was, there was uh, companies who said, well, I'll just wait until I'm asked for it. But in my experience, you know, certainly as, as Raul said, you know, even going back before that, it's the, the companies who actually realize that, hang on, this actually just makes sense for us, you know, regardless of whether the client is asking for it, you know, this just makes sense for us as a business. You know, we're a commercial business. We work on wafer thin profit margins. You know, anything that we can do to protect that small margin and, you know, uh, that enables us to be able to, you know, deliver more with the same resources or deliver, um, you know, more, uh, the same with fewer resources, you know, it's got to be a good thing. You know, as David said, that's the driver. You know, you don't need a client to tell you how to run your business. All right. That's that's my personal point of view anyway. Paul, very well said. Um, and just we're coming up towards the end of the panel discussion here. But I, I did want to, Paul, you know, you operate, uh, you know, an academy for this. Um, you know, when it comes down to the education, how you know, I, I'm thinking about, no, you know, thinking about the staff in my company saying to them, you know, go learn this, this, uh, you know, go spend some time on the weekend reading this, this standards document. And I'm, I can just see the eyes rolling right now. Yeah. You know, what, what do you, how do you think it's going to be addressed with the whole education of, of our industry and where, you know, is it sitting with post-secondary education? Is it up to organizations, mm -hmm. um, industry alliances and, you know, uh, uh, you know, events like this, or, you know, how do you yeah. think that's going to unfold? Um, so yeah, you're right, and I think you know again, uh, as in every conference uh, for the past however many years, the constant theme running throughout has been the people. Okay, in terms of people, process, and technology. Um, and so as a business, that's generally that's all we do. We don't do anything with technology. The process is pretty much done. So we focus in on the people, um, and that includes the current professionals. So there's a whole raft of people that we need to re-educate in terms of of how they work. Um, but like you say, there's the next wave, the next generation. Uh, of initial professionals coming through. Um, I think Ben picked up on it in, t in terms of the, the variety now of you know, degrees and masters and PhDs, uh, but very much they tend to focus in on the, so the, the technology aspect of, of information management and, and very few on the, on the management. If anything, it's like a small module, uh, but we're not looking to create a new profession. We don't want a profession of information managers. You know, for me, uh, information management should, should be a core subject area on every degree in the construction industry. You know, architects, engineers, project managers, quantity surveyors, asset managers, facilities managers, they should all have this module uh, as a key element or a key part of it, not just a lesson or go and read the standard, you know, a key key aspect of it. Um, so that's not happening. In terms of the, the current professionals, I think the problem is, you know, the standard was never written. You know, I know it's dull as dishwater, you know, I know that and, you know, uh, but it was, it's not, they're not designed to be as learning resources. Okay. Um, and yes, you know, we can, we provide as others do, um, education around the different activities within the process that people can undertake their role in it, but that's not even the full, uh, the full picture. You know, there's only a certain amount that we can take people. Um, what they actually need is, is then, okay, we can teach them, um, you know, the concepts of principles behind each activity. We can teach them the best practice. Um, from around the world of how to undertake that activity. But then what they need is, okay, how do I do that activity in my company? How do I do that activity on this project? You know, that's the education that they need. Yes, they need the foundation there, but that's the bit that's missing as well. You know, every, no, very few organizations invest in developing training around their own business processes and projects. You know, that's the reason why we put the mobilization stage in. You know, it's a fundamental part of the process. 
what we go before the inks dry and the signatures were away, you know, away producing that information. You know, that mobilization sta stage there is it's called mobilizing resources. Okay, making sure that everybody understands what information they need to produce, when they need to produce it, and importantly, how they need to produce it. I appreciate I'll get that. Off the high <laughs> and I think I think we're just coming up on time here as Tom comes in. You're muted. Um, but I'd like to thank all the panelists um, for joining us. Um, Paul, David, Hammer, Raul. Um, and I will turn things over to Tom to close things out. Um, appreciate it. Wish we had more time for more conversations, but um, obviously um, as one of the organizers, I know that there's been a lot of demand for this and hopefully we'll be having more events focused on this and seminars in the future.